Welcome back to our master series about dual credit in Kentucky. My name is Robin Abair, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's session, which is all about Kentucky's newly revised dual credit policy and our brand new EPSO toolkit. We have big aspirations for this work because of Kentucky's first in the nation dual credit attainment goal and the launch of this brand new toolkit that's full of information and resources about dual credit and other early post-secondary opportunities. We are joined by an amazing panel of true pros today who have served on the advisory committee for the dual credit policy, including some very familiar faces and names. We also welcome CPE Zone President, Dr. Aaron Thompson, and the Vice President of K-12 Policies and Programs, Dr. Amanda Ellis. We will also be joined by our partners, colleagues, and friends from KCTCS and the Kentucky Department of Education, uh, Ms. Harmony Little and Dr. Beth Hargis. And then we'll round out today's session by welcoming our national partner and a crowd favorite, Alex Perry from the College in High School Alliance. This morning, we also want to really gratefully acknowledge Becky Gilpatrick, who is our colleague and partner from Kia, who is not with us on today's session, but she will join us on uh, the May 4th session for an entire webinar that is all about Kentucky's financial support for dual credit and how to make the most of that. As always, Trinity Walsh will join us later today with the dual credit data moment and today's challenge. There is an active question and answer box available during today's session, so feel free to drop questions and experiences there. We may not be able to answer all the questions during our PAC session today, but we will post a question and answer document along with today's recording on CPE's website after we wrap up. So be patient with us today. Our webinar will likely stretch to 45 instead of 30 minutes, but as always, we'll be recording and we'll make this available uh, to you later on. So let's dive into the new dual credit policy and attainment goal as we welcome Erin Thompson and Amanda Ellis into the room. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Robin. It's great to have you both here today. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I want to start our conversation this morning with you. Um, I'd like for you to share a little bit of background about the dual credit policy. Why is this the right time for a revision to our policy? Uh, great question. Let me start, give you a little bit of a history first. You know, we wrote our first policy way over 10 plus years ago in one of the first states to have such a comprehensive statewide policy that addresses how we are to work closely with P12 to build out what I call a considerable way of thinking about higher education, not just around affordability, how it would cost you less once you got to a college campus, but also how to think about creating a set of dialogues around the importance of higher education, uh, the importance of being prepared to do higher education, and in many cases, letting the student know that they can. So that first policy came out then. And then 2016, we did a revision because it, this is about continuous improvement. It is now since 2016 with the scholarships we received from the General Assembly to really push this out to most students in the state. And with our considerable effort with our education continuum, to look at how we could be better in providing this resource, not just thinking about the academic piece of it, right, the college credit, but how to really incorporate a, a, a standard of quality, a standard of focusing on equity, obviously, and a standard of understanding exactly how we can make it better because we have better data, we have better assessments. So this policy now really talks about the new future way of thinking about this continuum, the future way of thinking about connecting, once again, the original intent with now better legs, right? You know, that we can now do better measurement. We know the effects of, of dual credit, especially uh, once they got, to, we measure it even once they get to college and seeing the effects and how it has had a bigger, uh, larger, impact on those that historically have been disenfranchised from it. So this new policy now will concentrate heavily on how we build that pipeline better than we've ever built it, especially around those that never thought they could be in it or never had been in it or those that have been in it in just a small amount. 
such as our underrepresented populations and low income. So it's time to do a new policy now, Robin, purely because it, it, we, we uh, are at that place where we're talking more than ever the need to, because of college going, one good example, right, at 47.8% of going to those in Kentucky, talking about affordability, uh, personal example, my daughter's graduating from college this year in three years because guess what she had going in, you know, a lot of hours that were was connected with her major, but we're also talking about how do we be, do better connections even in that regard. So, a lot more knowledge, a lot more information, and really futuristically looking. I know we'll talk about the attainment goal in a little bit, but futuristically looking at how dual credit truly adds to where we're going in the state with preparing our students for the work outside of school. So that's the reason why it's important for us to do it now. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Thompson. I appreciate you mentioning uh, all of the data that we have. And I know our stakeholders who have been involved in this process have really looked to data. They've talked so much about the quality of the student experience and the quality of the coursework. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, well, we also know, and you've already mentioned equity. I know that that's really important to you and it's really important uh, to CPE. So um, let's shift now to talk a little bit about this first of its kind dual credit attainment goal. I know we're really proud of that. And um, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about the attainment goal and how it will support equity and CPE's overall 60 by 30 goal. You know, we are into, we have one of the best data shops in the nation within CPE and obviously within the state with our KY stats, you know, our P20 longitudinal data system. And several years ago, when I we took over, when I took over this position, we started talking about what would it look like in Kentucky uh, by 2030 to have a sustainable economy? What would it take for higher ed and P12, honestly, what did they need to do in order to be the biggest feeder of that? And what we know is that you can you can do tax incentives to bring business and industry to uh, our state, and that's really good. But what they tell us they want more is an educated workforce. And so we looked at predictive analytics and uh, that said that it would take at least 60% of our population to have a credential, post-secondary credential that mattered in order to continue to sustain that economy if it's growing, if it's building, and if it's thriving. And we do have that now. So that's where the attainment goal came. And we started building policies. In other words, we took that predictive level of understanding and create prescriptive uh you know, ideologies, I call it, policies to go to that. That's where a 60 by 30 came. And we know that dual credit is essential to getting us there. We just talked about it a second ago around affordability. We talked about it getting more students engaged. But we also know that it's been really essential with our data to show that people that are historically disenfranchised from higher education that the dual credit has in fact given them an opportunity to know that they can do the work and they've achieved the work. And now we've been able to measure that it has had a big effect and we're closing gaps. And that's what our data shows. So we thought why not have in that same ideological way of thinking about how we look at the state and the economic output to have an attainment goal for our dual credit. And so we've been really, really, really uh, good, if you will, in getting more people engaged. And if someone had told people in Kentucky three years ago that we would have an attainment goal of having 50% of our students with a dual credit uh, uh, behind their name before they went to college, people would have thought we were crazy. But that's our attainment goal now by 2030. And it's directly correlated with those that we need to have in dual credit. We're not trying to exclude anybody from it. We're trying to include everybody in it <laughs> because of the impact. So to have something intentional, Robin, that's what an attainment goal is. You can build strategies. You can build policy. You can build process. 
And you can look at the potholes, as I talk about all the time, you know, what's keeping certain people out of it. And so this attainment goes, goes directly as a part of our not just high level strategy, but some of our lower micro strategies to move toward that 60 by 30 attainment goal that we have for, for the state. So this attainment goal then will hopefully do several things. And you know what our overall uh, uh, strategic agenda is about. It is about affordability. It is about student success. It is about building talent, right? It, it, it's, it's about talking about that value proposition that everybody should have a, a, an understanding that they have an opportunity for college. Because if you don't know you have one, you don't really have one. But the item that crosses all four of those is an equity agenda. We leave nobody behind. And we give them that input it takes to compete. And that's the way we measure equity. And that's the way we are looking at the dual credit policy toward this attainment goal. We're using all four of those set of big goals. And that equity element that crosses all those and incorporating it in the policy. So we're not disconnecting. We're not disconnecting from the strategic plans of the campuses. We're not disconnecting from the needs and the strategic processes on our P-12 uh, folk. We're bringing them all together with truly a one way of focusing how we can get where we need to go, all of us with the inputs that we need to do, no matter what uh, sector we are involved in, to know that this is about getting all of our students an opportunity to have a success story like all three of us who are on the screen now and giving them those inputs that it takes. Let me be clear, dual credit is an equity input. Mm -hmm. It is an equity input. And by itself, not just what we're going to do with strategies to help people to get it. And sometimes people use the word equity way wrong in education. This is about closing gaps. This is about giving people opportunities to see how they can be a productive part of Kentucky's landscape. This is about creating generational mobility. You know, this is about all of that. So that's the reason why, probably a much longer answer than you wanted, but that's why. I love to hear you talk about uh, your vision of including all Dr. Thompson. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, Amanda, I'd like to uh, invite you into the conversation, too, um, for, for a little bit here. You know, our new policy says that in the ideal world, dual credit is a normalized part of every high school student's experience. And, you know, Dr. Thompson kind of talked about bringing everyone in. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd love to hear what you what that means to you, like it, to be normalized um, as a part of the high school experience. And how do we get there from here? Absolutely. Yeah, I that is that is the dream for sure. And I think the way we do that is how we're doing that on this on this webinar. It's not just one of us or one organization. It's all of us working together on the same page, moving in the same direction. And and that means that we start talking about dual credit opportunities in middle school that we are intentional with our advising, that we inform our families and not one entity can do that alone. It is too great. And we clearly have seen that if we work in silos, it doesn't go very far, but having clear um, avenues and opportunities and worthiness of a student and families to know that their children really are um, college material. Uh, and it's not just a stopgap, right? It's getting them to their career aspirations. And so I think when we look at the broader picture, how we work together on affordability piece, um, so I, I know everybody will be so anxious to hear Becky and talk about the dual credit scholarship because finances are it is a very big burden and it can be very intimidating. We have been um, incredibly blessed by our General Assembly with the support of financial barriers being removed and that legislation changing to expand it. The CTE courses with dual credit to earn credentials, 10 courses, that's huge. There are massive opportunities, but as Dr. Thompson said, if they don't know about it and they don't feel like they're eligible or they're not getting there, um, then it really isn't an opportunity. So it's really got to be a, a concerted effort and intention, not only to enroll students, uh, Robin, but really support students. This is rigorous coursework. This is a change in what students are used to, which is a great opportunity to see in the future what it could be like, um, what 
the coursework could be like and that the students can succeed. And we know research says when you put um, a challenge in front of a student, if they have clear objectives and outcomes with support, they can succeed and they usually do. Um, and so really, this is an opportunity for us to normalize something that shows a little glimpse into the future of what could be and what's out there for our students when they cross the stage um, at the end of their of their senior year, that there's some place that they are going, that they are, are have either had an experience, um, they have a little bit of a direction of what they may be interested in. They may not know exactly what they want to do, but having exposure to these courses, to these um, opportunities and programs just enhances their ability to to um I think probably clarify where where what direction they want to go in and that it is feasible it is doable that absolutely takes k-12 working together with our financial piece with our campuses and what we've seen especially on your webinars what just continues to inspire me is the relationships built um, between the campuses and our um, districts to say hey let's make this work Let's find opportunities for students. And I think that's why we've seen dual credit grow so quickly. Um, and, you know, the other the other piece around that is really just being intentional on who we engage in those conversations. And the true reality is, is credentialing more teachers. So that's something else we have to look at. In order to normalize it, you have to be able to offer those courses. You have to have credentialed, um, certified uh, teachers to be able to teach those courses. And of course, technology has been a big piece of that, which has been a great innovation to remove barriers to access to um, courses. But it certainly um, has to be an area we got to look at and think about how we really encourage teachers um, without burdening, burdening them with uh, credit hour cost, which we know we have the teacher scholarship, and I'm really elevating and honoring that additional um, support to our students to get those early opportunities. So um, I think we have some work to do, but gosh, what an incredible infrastructure we have um, and great momentum working in the direction. And I think this policy and the attainment goal just solidifies the priority around this and what we really can accomplish um, when we all come together and, and want to make this a goal for all students um, in our state. So thank you for the question. I think it's very timely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. All right. So uh, we're going to need to move on to Harmony and uh, and Beth, but any, I'll give you just like a second for a final word if you have one, Dr. Thompson. No final word other than, you know, just saying these are college courses uh, and connecting them with students in high school that can perform those courses, in fact, gives us an indication that we are preparing uh, students for college, quote unquote, and career. But the item that I'll just say for uh, for all of the audience is that it's going to take, I mean, you, to ensure quality, quality has to be there, to ensure it, it is a partnership between our P-12 and higher ed, right, because it is a college course. We have to have better advising to let people know, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that in a minute, to make sure that people understand before they go into it, this is a college course. And to be able then to evaluate those courses and to make them better, the other thing we're, we'll have to incorporate into them more, and we will, some, most are now, is a continuous way of actually improving on those courses each and every semester to ensure that it has the standard of quality that we want. So thank you, Robin. I appreciate this. All right. Thank you, Aaron and Amanda, for being with us today. Uh, welcome, Beth and Harmony. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, Beth, I think you kind of represent our secondary experience that students have, while Harmony, you're more on the post-secondary side of the conversation. So I'd like to just pose a few topics and then have each of you kind of respond about um, your own agency or institution's perspective. Like, what does this mean in uh, in your world? And, and feel free to also add any additional comments that you have that maybe don't exactly align to my questions. But um, I wanted to ask first about how the policy talks about providing meaningful dual credit experiences that are really aligned to students' um, post-secondary and career goals. It's been a huge topic of conversation with all of our stakeholders. So um, how are your agencies and how are you thinking about this and addressing this alignment? Thank you, Robin. Well, I, I will say this whole experience has really been an exemplar for collaboration leading to the increased meaningful dual credit and the career goals. And so this work has been very well planned and has increased the communication between both secondary and post-secondary education 
And I think as a result, we've been able to thoroughly discuss the importance of relevant dual credit and how that differs from just the accumulation of credit hours. At the secondary setting, the Office of Career and Technical Education is tasked with the oversight of all secondary dual credit and not just that within career and technical education. And in our division of student transition and career readiness, we have program consultants who work with our stakeholders to ensure continued alignment of our pathways to post-secondary degrees. And really, as a result of this work, um, the Office of Career and Tech Ed, or OCTE, has made dual credit a strategic priority for our office and has established a dual credit work group to monitor the efforts. And dual credit is part of Kentucky's educational accountability and the increased attention on the dual credit is really helping us communicate the relevance of early post-secondary opportunities. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, I, I want to echo what Beth says. First of all, the partnership has been tremendous, and I'm really thrilled to see what we are doing collectively to help move the needle uh, for students who need it and increase access and entertainment. You know, it fits well with one of KCTCS's strategic goals to increase underrepresented minorities in dual credit. So, you know, for us, it just continues to go hand in glove uh, with the work that we're doing. And it's, uh, you know, like Amanda said, you can't do it alone. We have to do this in partnerships. We have to do it with the intentionality. So we are grateful that the intentionality is part of the policy. You know, KCTCS has always been focused on what we say, make every credit count. Uh, you know, and we have many examples even prior to this policy uh, with tremendous work done in collaboration with KDE to create over 20 CTE uh, career pathways uh, to maximize the work ready dual credit scholarship and dual credit scholarship opportunities for students so that they do have that seamless transition after high school graduation. Of course, we realize that's not everybody's goal. So we also have tremendous uh, robust transfer pathways to ensure that students get either all of their general education certificates at KCTCS or that they get started on that. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I don't mention that, you know, students can get their first two years with KCTCS uh, before transferring. So all of this information is available in the pathway section on the dual credit website. And it is also something we're working on to ensure that, uh, you know, all of our high school partners are aware of so that they can localize them. Thanks, Harmony. You know, we've had on uh, other episodes of our of our webinar series, many representatives from the KCTCS system, and I've been amazed at the partnerships that they have formed with, uh, with the secondary schools in their areas. It's really amazing to, to hear about that. You know, we've talked, and uh, Dr. Thompson and Amanda also mentioned supports for students so that they're even more successful in dual credit. You know, not only do we want them to get there, but we want them to be successful in the courses that they take. So I'm wondering, what does support for students look like at the secondary and post-secondary level uh, for you all? Well, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, communication to me is a key component of the dual credit success. Again, as a result of this work, we've, we're working to ensure that students and parents have the information they need for a successful experience, including you know, syllabi, outlining the course expectations, timelines for um, registration and withdrawal, and information as to how the dual credit is the start of the degree attainment. It's not an end all. So two, we're increasing communication between school counselors, dual credit instructors, and the dual credit institution. And truly, this effort also includes providing professional training to the instructors and working with the instructors to ensure that they have the necessary post-secondary credentials in order to offer the coursework. Uh, so to build on that, uh, you know, it, it does start with that partnership and collaboration and ensuring that both the secondary and post-secondary are on the same page. And regardless of who interacts with students, it really starts with advising, making sure that students understand, uh, you know, what Beth said, uh, the, the opportunities available to them, uh, the timelines, et cetera. But also uh, really understanding that since dual credit students are, uh, or courses are uh, college credit coursework, as Dr. Thompson pointed out, we also want to make sure that students are aware of the fact that all uh, academic services that are available to college students are available to dual credit students, regardless of whether they take them at the high school, online, or on the campus. So that includes tutoring, library services, other student resources that are available to dual credit students. But I think the thing that we are also trying to get across with the agenda is because they are still at the high school, there is also that 
tremendous amount of level of support that that secondary can provide to high school students before they become, you know, only a college level student, and they have to learn how to navigate those pieces a little bit of their own. So it's almost like a soft launch, if you will. And that's a tremendous opportunity for dual credit students. And I would say particularly first generation students that maybe don't have parents or family members or others who can provide that information and resources to them. And that's really where the uh, secondary and post-secondary have the opportunity to step in and, and provide the students with those services so that when they graduate high school and they step on that college campus, potentially for the first time, if they took all their dual credit coursework in high school, they are better prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Beth and Harmony. You know, we've talked so much about communication, the importance of that, just having students understand what is available to them and and uh, not just in a, you know, like, let me show you this on a website or on a sheet of paper, but actually let me show you where you get this uh, information or how you get this support in a, in a more personalized way. You know, our policy, one last question, our policy goes into a good bit of detail about this ideal student experience. And a lot of that is, is on the practical side of affordability, transferability. And we've talked quite a bit about that, but it also talks about kind of the more personal student side of things like, um, building a sense of belonging, uh, helping students to understand this, um, the high expectations of post-secondary um, coursework and, and even personalizing their experience. So I'm just curious to hear how important do you think these things are to student accept success and how do we how do we get there? How do we help students accomplish them? Again, great question. And as you know, I, I should always wear a t-shirt that says, you know, communication is my, my hashtag, but <laughs> the policy work has really helped us realize the importance of all of this. There are so many keys to success, but the bottom line is to meet the student where they are and help them get to where they need to be. And of course, as educators, we say that all the time. It's just a few words, but obviously it's much more difficult to accomplish. Each student has their individual needs, and we just have to ensure that administrators and instructors from both the secondary and post-secondary sides are really prepared to address those needs. So as part of this work, our office has completed opportunity gap analysis training, which is really enabling us to address the dual credit equity issues and ensure that all students have this opportunity, and not only just to participate, but to be successful. And this is directly aligned to the new policy. Again, it's all about caring for the students and having the conversations with them about their futures, involving the career coaches, the guidance counselors, everyone that can play a significant role in this. And sometimes, you know, we need somebody that will just hold our hand and guide us to where we need to be. And the policy and the toolkit that have been completed through this work are truly, um, they're leading the work. They're guiding what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, like every question you've asked us, we can probably dedicate an entire, entire webinar just on, <laughs> on that right. topic. So it's it's kind of hard just to hit the high points because I want to flesh out everything Beth said, and I completely agree with her. But, you know, um, it's so important. And like with any student, whether it's a dual credit student, a high school student or a college student, they're really craving that personalization. And I think a lot of it comes down to the advising, but also that connection and knowing who they need to go to on campus to get the answers that they want, the information that they need, and just feel like somebody understands them. So we do not have a silver bullet, but we're, we're exploring different ways and trying just to feel, find ways to meet students where they are, as opposed to it being rather prescriptive and just saying, here is one way. And again, that, that does not happen here at the system, right? That is the work that takes place at the college level, at the partnership level, with the individual institutions. We do have technology tools that can help us to some degree, and we're utilizing them whenever possible. Uh, but it really is, you know, harken back to what Amanda said, it really is about the partnership and the intentionality, and also the sharing of information. And, you know, I saw a couple of the questions in the chat that I know you'll address at, at some point, you know, but people are wondering, how do we make sure this is available to everybody? It's understanding that for everybody that is not at the same time, right? Some people, students might need, might not be able to do dual credit until 12th grade. Some students might start in the CTE pathway. Some student might start somewhere else. Any and all of that is okay. Uh, you know, and, and I think that is the message, right? We have opportunities for everybody, but we just need to figure out what we can do collectively to help them get there and then ensure that what they are taking while they're in dual credit coursework is meaningful and intentional to what they plan on doing after high school. Right. Well, Beth and Harmony, I hate to call cut the conversation off, but I need to move on to Alex. I knew you'd Thank have you. to. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and just again appreciate um, 
just you're um, you're referring back to how this work has sort of opened our eyes to some things we hadn't thought about or hadn't considered in the past and is causing us to kind of innovate in the space that, you know, that is is already existing. So thank you all so much. And um, we'll we'll address those questions in the chat uh, a little bit later on. Thank you, Harmony and Beth, for being here. Thank you. My Alex, pleasure. I want to welcome you. Uh, this is our partner, Alex Perry, from the College and High School Alliance. Alex, thank you for being here. Yeah, and I want to just begin by saying a great big thank you on behalf of our entire Kentucky team. We have so appreciated the partnership with you and your um, help and guidance and pointing us toward the right resources and the right research for the work that's been going on. Um, I wanted to just get a little personal kind of reflection from you today um, about your work here in Kentucky. So what is your perspective on Kentucky's work and the future of dual credit in our state? And especially, what do you think we have to celebrate? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of really, really exciting work happening in Kentucky from a national perspective, right? Um, one of the things that has become increasingly obvious for every state is the need to create a vision for the role that dual credit plays within any within any state's education system, right? Like some of those questions also coming through in the Q&A, right? Feeding in some of those ideas around, well, what is this, right? Like, is this moving college into high school? Is this disrupting the high school experience? And I think the vision that's included within Kentucky's new dual credit policy really sort of tries to answer some of those questions, right, about these are college access and success mechanisms, and the attainment goal is designed to say, listen, I, I think we're not really trying to cannibalize college into high school. We're trying to expand college going generally and increase the number of students who ultimately find themselves both graduating high school and matriculating into a post-secondary experience. And like, that's the real kind of drive here. And Kentucky's the first state in the nation to have set a dual credit attainment goal and have a comprehensive vision that's outlined in policy that says, this is really what we're trying to do here, right? Like we're not just sort of saying dual credit is a thing that exists and we accept it and it's just sort of happening. We're saying, yes, it's a thing. Yes, it exists. Yes, it's happening. But we have certain expectations. We have a path that we want to go on. We have a vision about what access should look like for these programs. And I think that really sets the state up for many of these sort of new next phase conversations about not just like how do we make dual credit readily available right that's already happening out there in the field but how do we make dual credit readily available in a way that really supports student success that improves college access and success and serves the state as a whole yeah uh, alex i really appreciate um all of the all of the resources that you brought to us and stories from other states and what is happening there and and really helping our team um, develop a vision and think about where where do we want to go as a state. So I'm curious, what do you think is the is the most important thing for us to pay attention to moving forward? Like, is there research? Or is there like a next step? Yeah. What is the most important thing for us? Yeah, I think the next big conversation is the intentional dual credit conversation, right? Like. Do credit attainment is already pretty high in the state of Kentucky, right? Like a 50% attainment goal, well, that's based off of a 43% floor in 2021, right? We're only really talking about expanding dual credit attainment by 7% from where it is today. Um, it's not like we're going from 10 to 50, right? Which would be a really sort of, you know, like, like something that would never be achievable within that period of time. Um, and so there's a lot of dual credit already happening in the state of Kentucky and more students are taking more courses. And as more students take more courses, it really is important that we think about, we're really sort of thoughtful about like the what, right? Like what courses are students taking? How is that aligned to the students' goals post high school, whatever those might be? How is that kind of ultimately, how are the dual credit experiences that a student is having ultimately serving that? college going, college access, college success route that's going to expand the ranks of college students as a whole within the state of Kentucky um, and be a boon both to the secondary system and to the post-secondary system. To me, that feels like the next big conversation. On top of that, I would say the question about 
who has access, right? Like um, you heard Dr. Thompson up front talk really eloquently about, right? Like this is an equity strategy. It is really important to be thinking about who doesn't have access. And I think there are, you know, there's obviously big sort of populations of students that have been identified as being underrepresented in participating in these programs right now. But there are other student populations that I think we also want to start thinking about, right? Like not currently reflected in the data around dual credit students with disabilities, not currently represented English learners. Um, like those are two student populations, right? Like there is every expectation for almost all students with disabilities that they should be in a position to take a dual credit course while they're in while they're in high school right like there's nothing about many students disabilities that prevent that from happening um and i think that's sort of a next generation conversation too right which is like sort of thinking more expansively about the whole kentucky student population and the role that dual credit can play for those students within their journeys towards post-secondary and to college success. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. I'm going to make a plug right now for our next webinar. Next, It happens next week, and uh, David Beach from UK's um, Disability Services will be on with us to talk about just that issue that you brought up. Um, Alex, I'm going to give you one opportunity uh, to, to uh, have some parting words or to tell us a little bit about like national forecasting. Are the same things on the national agenda that we're experiencing in Kentucky? Or is there something new on the horizon or uh, just any anything you want to you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, I just I think Kentucky is at the leading edge of a lot of these conversations, right, in terms of um, that piece around intentional dual credit and, and also around, I think, starting to write like CPE has been really good about going out and doing research on Kentucky dual credit and producing research reports that really add to our knowledge about what does it like, what is the impact of dual credit? How can we make it more successful? I think for the field as a whole, right? Like I think we're starting to realize that, you know, a lot of definitions of dual enrollment that are just about providing a high school student with access to a college course probably not enough, right? Like it's not enough just to give access to a student. There's probably a host of services and supports that students need in order to make sure they're successful. Any student participating in these course experiences, so what does that look like? Um, as we have lots of different programs with lots of different models, kind of digging deeper into those questions about like, well, which program practices are most effective for which students? And what does that mean from a policy perspective then in terms of expanding those out? Um, and I think my kind of big crusade Coming, uh, coming soon, it's like on the national level, we make this so complicated and so difficult to talk to students and parents about this. We don't even use the same terms nationally, right? It's dual credit in Kentucky. It's dual enrollment over the border in Tennessee. It's college credit plus just to the north in Ohio. It's dual credit again in Indiana, right? Like, I mean, we, we don't even have sort of a common national lexicon to describe these terms that we're all using consistently. And I think that feels like it's a big sort of like a uh, hoity-toity national ed policy challenge but actually think about it from the student perspective right you go on google and you google dual enrollment right what are you going to get are you, or you google dual credit are you going to get re, re, um, results that are relevant to you i think there's a really important conversation that needs to happen yeah. all right well alex thank you again for being here with us today Thank you for your great comments as usual. And also just thank you again for the great support you've provided to our Kentucky team through this whole journey. We, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. All right. So we want to uh, wrap things up now with our data moment with Trinity Wall. So Trinity, I'm going to go ahead and invite you into the room and um, we'll get ready to uh, share your slides. All right, hello and good morning. Um, wow, I hope that our panel today has encouraged you to think about your dual credit programming with your institutions, whether that's secondary or post-secondary and how you can help move the needle further towards more access and success for your students um, when it comes to dual credit and all of Kentucky students. As our panelists have discussed, Increasing dual credit participation in Kentucky is one way that we can continue to encourage our students' academic success. 
but it will also increase our workforce readiness and our community success. The goal of having 50% of our high school students taking at least one dual credit course during their academic career is really not that unattainable. And it truly only takes small moves. What I mean by making only small moves, if each public high school in Kentucky added one to two more students each year, we would meet the goal. But rather than just meeting the 50% goal, what if we could also close our underrepresented student gaps while attaining this goal? So how can we intentionally add one to two underrepresented students each year? How can we examine these populations in a meaningful way so that again, we're not just working towards an attainment goal, but we're helping to make our dual credit programs better for students we might be missing, like the special education and English learners that Alex just mentioned. How do we do this across the state at the secondary and post-secondary levels? So the dual credit attainment goal can be accomplished by implementing and exploring several strategies. First strategy is expanding access and success among students with little or no current access to dual credit. Who are these groups and why are they not participating or earning dual credit? Focusing on providing Kentucky students with meaningful dual credit experiences. What general education courses are your high schools offering? Or what CTE or work ready courses are being offered at the dual credit level? How can post-secondary institutions examine their community and reach out to high schools to partner and grow these programs? As we've talked about a lot here, this is a team effort, lots of partnerships. Supporting student success in dual credit. What types of counseling are students receiving from the high school and post-secondary levels? And how are dual credit courses marketed to those students and families? How are we strengthening partnerships between high schools and colleges and engaging employer partners? Take a look at your high school credentialing and consider if you're missing anyone or if there might be some teachers who would be interested in being dual credit credentialed. What kinds of communication and partnerships do you have with your local community members and businesses? And how can you engage them in your dual credit programming for supports? And finally, expanding access to early post-secondary opportunities as a whole. Consider how your high school or post-secondary institution can expand EPSOs, but not at the expense of other opportunities. Are there programs that could just use some more robust and rigorous programming, and can dual credit help with that? I've posed a lot of questions when considering these strategies, and I'm not going to leave you empty-handed. We've created a dual credit attainment goal worksheet to help you and your teams at the high school and post-secondary levels to ponder, reflect, plan, and take some action on achieving this goal. We've discussed this before. The excellent online tools that we have in Kentucky are robust, and using your Kentucky School Report Card in conjunction with the worksheet is a great starting point. If you're a post-secondary institution, we're not leaving you out of this work either. You can just as easily access this information information for schools in your service area to determine how you can partner with these schools for better student success and outcomes. On the screen, there's a bit.ly to the dual credit attainment worksheet, but we'll also have it available on the CPE dual credit resources webpage. We encourage high schools to share their worksheet discoveries and ideas with post-secondary institutions to really create a strong partnership that both institutions can feel good about and what they're creating and promoting. We hope that this can help guide your work and allow you to dig into these important questions with your programs for greater access and future success with dual credit in your area. Okay, thank you, Trinity. Uh, great ideas as usual in our, our uh, data moment. So um, we're going to round out our webinar this morning uh, with our first look at the EPSO Toolkit. We are beyond excited to share the first public look at the Kentucky uh, Early Post-Secondary Opportunity Toolkit with you today. The toolkit contains ideas and resources that practitioners across Kentucky can use to gain a better understanding of all early post-secondary opportunities, and especially for now, dual credit. Please understand that this 
toolkit is a living document and it will continue to iterate and grow as resources and research and promising practices and examples from the field of experts and practitioners are added. And we certainly invite you to be a contributor to that collection. So each section in the toolkit contains promising practices, quick guides, bright spots, and additional resources that are helpful to practitioners that are involved in, uh, in dual credit. So I'm gonna share uh, the screen here so that you can see um, the different sections in the toolkit. So each section um, that is listed here is a different page or a different um, category in the toolkit. <clears throat> and the information is organized around these topics that you see on the screen. So the program section introduces different kinds of early post-secondary options or opportunities that students can choose from. And it gives some basic detail about each one. The partnerships section breaks down the importance of strong collaboration between secondary schools, institutions of higher education, families, students, and other partners, such as the college board in the case of advanced placement. This section also helps to define different roles and responsibilities and how to establish and maintain partnerships that really promote the best outcomes for students. I'm not gonna go through all of the different um, sections in the toolkit, but as you can see, each section addresses an important element of the early post-secondary opportunity. I'm gonna change the view now so that you can actually see the, um, so that you can actually see the toolkit. Now you'll you'll see here that there is a navigational panel over on the left hand side of the toolkit where you can select any of these topics that you want to view as well as boxes here at the bottom of the screen where you can scroll down and select the section that you might want to um, that you might want to explore. I do want to emphasize that there is a link to a Google form right here on the oops right here on the homepage where you can submit your own resources or institutions or where you can recommend other partners and resources that you know about from your practice that we would want to share through this toolkit. For now, most of the bright spots that you'll see on the different pages and the resources in the toolkit have been populated by some of our webinar series guests. You'll see a lot of the information that you've heard about, and we certainly want to provide more examples and more ideas. So please submit your own bright spots for consideration. I'll give you an example of what that might look like. So on the programs tab, when you scroll down, you see some information here, but you're going to see bright spots and Here's the Davis County Public Schools partnership with Owensboro Community and Technical College that we've talked about. And you'll also see the quick resource guides down here about different types of opportunities. And you can um, click on these resources, print them for students, and then additional resources for practitioners, some links and other things that you can, um, that you can access. So each page is kind of organized in that way. There is also a contact us page that you can click on. And it has the information for Amanda, Trinity, and me. And um, we would love for you to contact us with general comments or suggestions to consider as we continue to make the toolkit more and more user-friendly and useful to you. Uh, Harmony actually gave the idea that uh, we would just love to hear from you about what's missing. What do you wish was in the toolkit that's not here so that we can start um, looking for that information and those resources to add? Well, I know that you're really eager to get into the toolkit and look around. And so I'll end with a link and a QR code that you can use to access that. And so there's the QR code, and I think uh, Trinity is going to drop the link to that and to the dual credit policy into the chat now, so that um, if you if you so desire, you can go ahead and start to explore. Well, we are out of time for today, but I want to give just a great big thank you for joining us. We had a lot on the agenda, and um, we've shared a lot of information about both the policy and this new toolkit. So a few quick reminders. 
If you're interested in joining us for the dual credit community of practice, please fill out the form that's linked here in uh, by this QR code. We will be continuing to reach out and discuss this opportunity and form the community of practice uh, teams. We've also uh, we've already had a few communications, a few little get togethers to discuss what this is actually going to look like. We also have a new opportunity that I wanted to tell you about today that is really available to this group. We want this group to kind of synergize and think about it, but it has to do with access to open education resources for students, especially those in um, healthcare related fields. So please let us know if you're interested in that. And a good way of doing that would be to fill out this form and we'll follow up with you. Uh, you're, not, you're not signing your life away by uh, filling out the form. You're just letting us know that you're interested. So please take advantage of that today if you haven't already done so. Um, I do want to let you know that the next webinar in our series is scheduled for April 22nd or 27th, I'm sorry, next Thursday, and it will focus on advising and student supports. We've talked a lot about that today. We'll re really dig in next week. We'll share about a dynamic partnership between Highlands High School and Northern Kentucky University, and we'll also hear from David Beach, who we mentioned earlier who is the um, Disability Services Coordinator at the University of Kentucky. So you, uh, we, we know you don't wanna miss it. Um, too few of our students with disabilities take advantage of dual credit courses. So you definitely wanna hear that part of the conversation, but also about how Highlands and Northern Kentucky work together to make sure that students are well supported through their dual credit experiences. We do sincerely appreciate the participation and enthusiasm you've shown for dual credit in Kentucky and for this webinar series. Thanks again to Aaron, to Amanda, Harmony, Beth, and Alex for joining us as our guest today. So until next time, I hope you enjoy this sunny Thursday. We'll see you next week.